Over the next few weeks, we are exploring what it means to share our testimony about Jesus. Everyone has a story to share. Sometimes we expect our story to touch the hearts of others, but sometimes sharing our story actually transforms us. Today's passage is from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 38. I am reading from the New Living Translation. Hear now how a man shares his story about his encounter with Jesus and in the telling grows in his own faith. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. Jesus answered, This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, Go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. In Siloam means, means sent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, No, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, Yes, I am the one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them. The man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed and now I can see. Where is he now? They asked. I don't know. He replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it. So he told them. He put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man, Jesus, is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. Others said, But how could an ordinary sinner do such a miraculous sign? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, What's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see. So they called in his parents. They asked them, Is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, We know this is our son and that he has been born blind but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him, he is old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, he is old enough, ask him. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him. God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I don't know whether he is a sinner. The man replied. But I know this. I was blind and now I can see. But what did he do? They asked. How did he heal you? <sighs> Look. The man exclaimed. I told you once. Didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Or do you want to become one of his disciples too? They cursed him and said, You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Why, that's very strange. The man replied, He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from? We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man was not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner. They answered. 
Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I have a question for you guys this morning. What's the most exciting thing that's happened to you in your journey of faith so far? Scripture is full of people who encountered God in amazing and sometimes perplexing ways. Dreams and visions, thundering clouds and a still small voice, heralded by angels and walking along the lake shore, spitting into the dirt and wiping mud on someone's eyes. God shows up and invites people to become part of the unfolding story, but sometimes our accounts of these amazing things are met with questions, aren't they? And sometimes we ourselves are the ones who can hardly believe what has happened. In our culture, we have a tendency to want to be exactly sure about facts and details. We want to see pictures or it didn't really happen. We have been trained to only be certain about that which is provable and repeatable. So what do we do when we encounter a God who sometimes seems to provoke more questions than answers? Now, I'll be honest. There are things that I struggle to understand let alone try to explain to someone else. But you know what? There are some things that we do know. We do know about the love and grace and healing and mercy found in Christ Jesus. And these are things that are worth sharing with others. Our testimony about the great things of God matters, even if we don't quite understand how everything works yet. We've been talking the last couple weeks about what testimony is. Last week, we explored the idea of how a testimony is simply an account of what God has done and is doing in your life. From dramatic stories of reversal and transformation to quieter stories of everyday grace, these testimonies are a means of pointing out how the love of God is still at work in the world beckoning all of us into right relationship. Just like in the days of the early church, the gospel is spread most effectively today by word of mouth, as ordinary people simply say, hey, God did something and I can't wait to tell you about it. That's what happened when Jesus healed the man who was born blind. Can you imagine what it must have been like for this man? He's been blind all his life, and then a stranger comes over, smears some mud on his eyes, and tells him to go wash in a sacred pool. But the man follows these instructions, and miraculously, he is empowered to see. His neighbors almost don't recognize him as he's walking around, taking everything in, but he assures them that it's really him. His story is simple. This man they call Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me to go wash, and when I did, I could see. It's just an account of the bare facts of what happened, but all oh, the things that came from that man's story. You know, honestly, I'm sometimes surprised by this man's courage as he tells his story again and again and again. The more he told his story, the more he faced opposition, as people kept trying to get details out of him or put words into his mouth. It makes me think about all of the reasons why we ourselves sometimes shrink back from sharing our stories of encountering Christ. As amazing as our experience of Jesus may be, sometimes we clam up. Now, over the last several years, I've heard all kinds of reasons for why people choose not to bear witness. And if I'm honest, I've used some of those excuses myself. So I invite us to take some time to consider three of those common reasons for avoiding sharing our testimony and consider how this healed man might help us choose a different way. 
One reason that I myself have used in the past is, oh, but my testimony isn't good enough. Somebody else's story is much more compelling than mine. But friends, while your story might seem ordinary to you, it is powerful for someone else. Your story of faith is far from boring. The truth is, your testimony is both unique and part of a larger story. Your encounters with God are particular to your own experience and situation, but at the same time, your life is an amazing chapter in the ongoing story of God. You might think about it in this way. Consider a jazz ensemble. There are many individual instruments. You have your saxophone, your trumpet, your drums, your piano, the bass. They're all part of the same unit, harmonizing together to create a single tune. But there are times when each one will stand up and play out, putting their own twist on the melody. It's the same music that's heard through a different instrument. The bright and blaring trumpet solo is very different from the cool and groovy sounds of the bass solo, but each one is an essential part to the overall texture of the music. And so it is with our testimonies. My story may not be like your story, but sharing our unique testimonies contributes to the larger story of God that we're both a part of. Now, if you're having trouble seeing value in your own story, Try looking at your story from a different perspective. For example, consider how your story resonates with a passage of scripture or a story from the history of the church. I know that whenever I share the story of my call to ministry, I usually start by telling the story of how God called Samuel when he was a boy in the temple. It took him several tries to figure out that it was God speaking. Connecting my unique story to an account in scripture helps me to see how God continues to speak into the world today, just as God always has. You might also think about how your testimony adds a new dimension to the ongoing story. After all, Jesus had healed people before. What happened to this man was nothing new, but it was new to that man. It was a personal thing that happened to him. Maybe the people who heard his story didn't know Jesus, but they knew that man, and they knew how he was transformed, and that personal connection mattered. Another common reason we give for not sharing our testimony with others is that it's awkward. It feels weird. Talking about Jesus isn't seen as popular or politically correct these days. No one wants to be known as that Jesus freak or a Bible thumper, right? But friends, isn't that who we are? We are people who follow an extraordinary Lord, and we believe that the world desperately needs Christ. So why do we act like we're ashamed of that? The reality is that our Christian faith doesn't always sit comfortably in the world around us, the world that is broken and in need of healing. It's going to feel awkward sometimes if we're concerned about how other people think about us. But if we're more concerned about how God thinks of us, perhaps we can learn how to speak boldly in spite of the pressure. Now, it is certainly good to be mindful of your particular context. Different situations may call for a different way of speaking about God, and we must become adept at adaptation. Consider the man who was healed. His story was consistent. I was blind, now I see, and this man Jesus had something to do with it. But the way he told his story varied depending on who he was talking to. He was plain spoken with his neighbors who knew him, and he dished out the same sass that the Pharisees gave him. He wasn't afraid to tell his story, but he also wasn't afraid to address the situation that was at hand. Now, to be frank, dear friends, the only way for us to overcome the feeling of awkwardness we sometimes have is to just grit your teeth and plunge in anyway. Practice talking about God with people you trust 
And as you become more confident, practice talking about God with other people whom you meet. After all, we willingly spend hours practicing how to throw a baseball or how to use a specific program at work. How much time do we put into practicing sharing the gospel? When I was in college, I was part of an a cappella group. And one day we were puzzled because our director made us get up out of our seats and all crowd into the bathroom together. And as we sang, we watched ourselves in the mirror and we realized something. We sang this beautiful, glorious music, but our faces were dead. It didn't matter how beautiful the sound was if we didn't look like we were enjoying ourselves. So we spent many, many rehearsals crowded into that bathroom, practicing opening up our faces and smiling with our eyes and singing like we meant the words. And it had a huge effect on the way our performances went later on. Well, friends, in the same way, our testimonies get better the more we practice them and take the time to share them. It might be different for each of you. Some of us may need to write it down and practice it verbatim. Some of us need to just stand in front of a mirror and say, hey, this is a cool thing that happened. Some of us need to practice with our family and friends and get feedback, and others just jump right in and let the Spirit give them the words. But in every case, we do this so that it becomes part of who we are. So it feels like second nature to open up and share the great things of God when the opportunity presents itself. And we don't just do it once, do we? How does the old saying go, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again? I invite you to do the same when you're talking about how God has touched your life. Now, a third reason we sometimes refrain from sharing our testimony is, oh, but I don't have enough training. I don't have all the answers to the questions people may ask, or I have too many questions myself. But dear friends, as you share your stories, I assure you, it is okay to still have questions and even doubts. That's part of what it means to be on a journey of discovery. Your testimony is still worth sharing. In fact, sometimes I think it's those questions and doubts that make our testimony relatable. They're opportunities to spark interest in someone else and then invite them to come and explore and discover together. There is a holiness, I think, in asking questions. After all, if we think we have all the answers, how will we learn anything new? Our faith grows precisely because we have questions. So do we have the spiritual flexibility and holy imagination to admit that we may not have all the answers, that another perspective might have value? I know that some of the most fruitful conversations I have had has been not when I've pontificated on my favorite subjects as though I'm some expert, which I assuredly am not, but the conversations have borne fruit when I've been humble enough to say, you know what, I don't know, but let's go find out. The Samaritan woman, whose testimony we explored last week, she had questions. Could this really be the Messiah? But that didn't stop her from sharing her experience with people and inviting them to come and see. And in a similar way, the healed man didn't have all the answers to the questions the Pharisees posed to him but he unashamedly proclaimed what he did know. I was blind, now I see, and this man Jesus had something to do with it. The more the man tells his story, the more he grows in his own understanding of who Jesus really is. Now some of my friends and colleagues have a favorite saying, preach it till you believe it. It's kind of a churchy way of saying fake it till you make it. And you know, even John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, he had to do that sometimes. In one of his journal entries, he writes about a time when he had so many questions, he started to doubt the sincerity of his own faith. And he went and told one of his friends, you know what, I don't think I'm going to preach anymore. I need to wait until I, I'm more sure about what I'm saying. But the advice that his friend gave him wasn't to stop preaching. Rather, his friend said, preach faith until you have it. 
And then when you have it, when you have faith, you'll preach it. Wesley took that advice, and he found that the more he shared the faith he claimed, even with his questions, the more his own faith was restored. Now, I'm not saying to go and tell people something that you don't really believe. We must have integrity, after all. But if we never speak about God simply because we don't understand some aspect of the mystery of the divine, what do we do with all these things that we do know? How will we ever know God more intimately if we don't ask the questions and invite others to explore with us? Even if it's with the caveat of, I'm not sure how this works, your testimony still counts because it opens up the opportunity to learn more. It invites the spirit to move and it creates space for your own faith to be restored. As we explore our stories together, I encourage you to make use of the tools available to you through the church to deepen your knowledge and understanding and give you that security some of you may be looking for. Join a Sunday school class. Participate in a Bible study. Come talk to your pastors. That's literally why we're here. Make use of those tools. Discover more. And then share what you have discovered with someone else. Now, as we work together toward overcoming these hindrances to sharing our testimony, there's something else I'd like to invite you to consider. When we think about sharing our testimony, we usually focus on the person who will hear it. How will my story change this person? But what if we flipped that around? It is said that the one who gives is as blessed as the one who receives. And I think it's the same way with sharing our stories. Sharing our testimony affects us as much as, if not more than, it affects the person hearing it. Consider the healed man's experience. His parents, neighbors, and religious leaders may or may not have come to trust in Jesus based on his testimony at that point. But there was still transformation happening. Did you catch it? Every time the man told his own story, he himself gained a new understanding about who Jesus really is. First, he thinks about Jesus simply as a man, a miracle worker, but still just a man. Then he wonders if Jesus could be a prophet. Then he discovers, well, maybe Jesus is from God. And finally, he falls to his knees and calls Jesus Lord. Even though his community questioned him, those questions became opportunities for he himself to explore and to pray and to grow in his understanding of the things of God. I've experienced that too. I have an old friend who happens to be an atheist. And as we got to be good friends, I admit there was a little idea in the back of my mind that I could offer him Christ, change his life for the sake of the kingdom, right? Not try to beat him over the head with the gospel, but making a point to be more open and honest about my own relationship with God and invite him to come and see too. But y'all, I'll admit, even today, I sometimes cringe at how ham-fisted I was. Or I'd kick myself, thinking, why didn't I say this more eloquently? Sometimes my friend would throw out a zinger that made me have to say, you know what? I can't give you an answer that you're going to like. But this much I do know. The truth is, maybe God was using my words, however faulty they may have been, to touch the heart of my friend, but even if I didn't notice it at first, transformation was still happening. It just wasn't happening where I expected to see it. You see, the more I shared my testimony and talked about God with my friend, the more God changed me. Every time I put myself out there to share my story, I gained confidence. Every time my friend came back with a difficult question I couldn't answer, I became curious and went home to read and pray and reflect. And sometimes God would open something up to me that I couldn't articulate before. Sharing my faith with my friend and hearing my faith reflected back to me helped me see where I still needed to learn and grow. Maybe I thought I was sharing my story to change my friend, but God was using my testimony to change me and to deepen my faith 
too. So friends, this morning I want to give you another challenge. Last week, I challenged you to do two things. Consider what God has been doing in your life lately and then tell someone about it. Well, this week, I'm gonna give you an option. Option number one, think about one question you have about the life of faith. What's something you're curious about? Then go and invite someone to explore that question with you. That's option number one. Option number two, consider how your own faith and understanding of Jesus has grown over time. What caused that growth? Can you guess what part two of this is? Tell someone. Invite someone to become part of that story too. My hope for all of you is that you will be blessed not with having answers, but with having a unique experience that is worth sharing for the sake of the kingdom of God. Will you pray with me? God of grace, you have entered into our lives and our hearts in such a profound way. Sometimes we don't quite understand what is happening or have the words to precisely describe what you are doing. We're not always sure how to share your good news when we have questions ourselves. Even so, we trust that you are doing marvelous things in the world, and we thank you for the opportunity to help others notice what you're up to. Grant that we may have the courage to speak of what we do know, of your love and mercy and grace, and share that with the world. Amen.